you for the introduction. My talk today is just intended to be a very general overview of things going from nanotechnology to giga, giga something, or whatever the giga is, the gigahertz or uh, gigaton, no, <laughs> uh, something large anyway. Um, it's intended to expose you to the challenges involved in terms of uh, measurement. Uh, you will hear a lot of talks about nano and things like that, but before you can produce things and do things with it, you have to be able to measure them, characterize them, and then you can optimize your design uh, or do something with it. I also want to expose you to um, many different products that Agilent uh, has developed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, these are pretty new products that I'm going to be talking about in helping us now, what these products mean to our daily lives? So what are some of these measurement technology? What we do, uh, what does it mean to us? You know, why do I care? You know, what, uh, what these measurements mean that will uh, have uh, some kind of impact to what we do every day, what we use every day? You know, simple thing like your cell phone. You know, I mean, how, many, how many of you have a cell phone? Maybe more like you don't have one. <laughs> oh, one. <laughs> okay. And you all watch TV. You, know, you all drive cars. You. What about GPS? How many of you actually use GPS uh, when you're driving around? So it's a very high percentage of you doing that. Okay. And so what I'm going to talk about has some influence in those areas, and uh, it will make things a little bit easier, better. You know, these cell phones way back when like uh, even 10 years ago. Uh, you, you hold your hand, you talk for about five minutes, it gets warm, it's hot. Today, do you feel that at all? It's cool, reasonably cool, and gets smaller as well. So actually, all that development, all these advancements, relates to some of the things that we can do in terms of measurement technology, and uh, be able allow the designers to improve their design and get things more efficient. So let's get started. So what I'm going to talk about is first is what is measurement science and technology, and then talk about the scale of things with respect to the meter and then to the second. And then I'm going to talk uh, about a little bit of the history uh, of measurement science and, uh, and samples of some new measurement equipments and applications and conclude with what is next? So what is measurement? Measurement is just a process of obtaining a magnitude of quantity. This is a very academic definition. Just measure something. You know, get data, right? Measure some quantity, whatever that might be. Uh, but the key to measurement also is all measure quantities are inexact. You have to understand that. There's no such thing as an exact measurement. No one can do an exact measurement of anything. They all have some kind of uncertainty involved. They all, they, they do not, they are only estimates of the true value. And all measurements need to relate to a set of base units. And what are these base units? These are called SI units, or the international systems of units. And these are the base units, the meter, the kilogram, second, ampere, Kelvin, mole, and kadama. All these are the basic ones that everything else is derived from, all the other measurements, quantities. And I have the definition. Don't try to read through that. Um, you, will t you can take your time in the, in the online version. And this just to show you the, the progression of how you go from the base unit to all the other units, like you know, from the meters and uh, and seconds, you can get velocity, volume, uh, acceleration, and from there you can derive uh, other uh, quantities that, like we use in electrical engineering, the mole, the conductance, resistance, uh, capacitance, 
And then you can also see that how Calvin and, and luminance are related to some of these uh, units, force or force. And some physical constants that are derived from these uh, base units. Now, these are the latest values uh, given by the international uh, standards uh, 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 work groups. And the speed of light by definition right now is exact because it's by definition. And you can remember those digits. And you can get that down to the last digit, and you're good. Um, the magnetic constant, uh, u0, is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 newton m uh, area square, uh, m square. <coughs> Electric constant and all these are defined, actually. And you can go to like NIST's website or any of the national labs' website, and you can get, a, get hold of the latest values. So what is measurement science and technology? So measurement science, also known as metrology, it concerns with the establishment of the unit system, like the SI unit, and the unit of measurements, and the development of new measurement methods. You know, how you measure these, you know, how do you determine uh, these uh, quantities as precisely as possible? Uh, yeah, like the speed of light a long time ago, uh, the Planck's constant, all the other things. And the realization of measurement standards. Okay, that's the main job. And it turns out that metrology has numerous connotations or in implications. But one is the legal aspect of it. You know, how do you know a gram is a gram, a meter is a meter? Right, so in terms of international trade, I say I sell you one gram of material. Well, how do I know that it's actually one gram? So you got to have international agreement to make sure that the quantities is correct. Uh, that's just only one aspect. So that's the legal aspect. And that, that all started from the, what they call the weights and measures. You know, when um, the gram is just only one of them, the volume or something, you know, when I say one liter or something, how do you know that it's a one liter? Right? So if you don't establish some sort of accurate reference, you may get cheated. Okay? And that's exactly why the, uh, uh, the weights and measure uh, um, uh, uh, department internationally established. So that internationally, everybody agree what a meter is, everybody agree what uh, a one kilogram is, all these uh, uh, standards. And measurement technology concerns with, but not limited to, the development of measurement apparatus. You know, uh, actual technology is part of that. And the realization and application of scientific principles and then extend the measurement science principle to more complex applications. Oops, wrong way. So let's look at the scale of things. In this case, it's the meter scale. Uh, the meter scale here, I go all the way from, uh, at least on this graph, from, um, oops, wrong way. One nanometer all the way to one gigameter. And you can see, like, your hair usually is somewhere around here, a little bit more than you know, about 70 micron. And you can see uh, a quarter is about one, uh, one inch. And a football field is about 100 meters. And Mount Everest, uh, the height. And you can see the diameter of the sun is somewhere around this area, right? And nano, actually, you have to go down further to see what nano really means. So when you talk about nano measurements, you're talking about measurements of anything that is less than 100 nanometers. In this case, you can see blood cell size, the bacteria here, that's actually a little bit larger than nano. Uh, virus, uh, DNA strands, the carbon nanotube and atoms. And these are all in this kind of uh, nanometer area, about a little bit. And when you talk about angstroms, that's why you're down here, 10 to the minus 10, right? And so now you're getting to basically atomic size, and then when you go below that, there's subatomic uh, sizes. In terms of time, I just want to illustrate a couple of things here. 
First, you think about the speed of light and the speed of sound. Well, uh, in one nanosecond, light travel about one foot, one nanosecond. In about 10 microseconds, or 9.1 microseconds, it will travel across the length of the Golden Gate Bridge. For sound to travel through the same span, it will take almost 10 seconds. And when you get up to the giga level, uh, you're looking at about light years of uh, equivalent time, uh, the seconds. So one year is about uh, three times 10 to seven seconds. So to get to the closest um, uh, star to the sun, it takes about 4.2 light years. That means the light travel 4.2 years to get there. And that's 4.2 times this many seconds. So that's a, a time scale in terms of looking the universe where we live in and what that really means in terms of time and distance. So let's talk about the history of metrology or measurements of science and the references. So we started out with a, a meter stick somewhere. And then also we had some of these you know, clunky looking calibers. Mm -hmm. Very few people use these today, but they are great references back then. Uh, a lot of people still use these as uh, length uh, gauge blocks in industrial applications where they define one inch and whatever the thickness or length of these things are as calibration standards. But it turns out that these artifacts do change with respect to time. And so a more modern, the, the, the latest definition of length and the meter is defined as the length of the paths traveled by light and vacuum during a time interval of so one divided by that many seconds. That's exactly the, the definition of the speed of light, the vacuum. And there, this is an actual apparatus in the NIST to set up to, to calibrate a meter or a length of things using a laser system. And then the weight measurement. And uh, we used to depend on a solid piece of metal and uh, in using some kind of balance to measure uh, the weight or the mass. And then, of course, the golden kilogram is kept in a vacuum jar to prevent any contaminations or evaporations of atoms on the surface, and that can change its mass. And this is being developed and discussed is to migrate from a physical kilogram standard to what is called a uh, basically a electrical um, traceable standard based on the balancing of a uh, mass, an actual physical weight to the uh, uh, current and voltage, uh, uh, the, the force generated by the current and the voltage relationships. Uh, this has been going on since the late 1990s and is still being developed and being compared. And uh, right now, the, um, this apparatus actually is an NIST uh, being used, and there are other apparatus, uh, things like this in other national labs to generate what they call a, a watt balance, because U times I is watts. <coughs> And time and frequency, uh, we are familiar with the pendulum clock. Many of us probably have seen it or have one in your home. Uh, that's not accurate enough, so eventually it developed into crystal oscillators so using cross crystal as a frequency reference for the clocks. And we still have uh, clocks and watches based on that. And then it went on to move to uh, atomic clocks, the cesium beam atomic clock. That was the first one in operation. And since then, it's retired. And um, this is the latest one uh, currently at NIST 
call the, uh, the, the function atomic frequency clock. Why do we need such accurate measurements for, in terms of the clock? See, you know, our everyday life only care about maybe uh, a second or less in terms of on time, uh, most things we do. But it turns out that there's a very important thing going on here. Uh, as a matter of fact, the latest development right now is still in, in, in under development is what they call the quantum logic clock. It allowed them to improve the accuracy to basically three times more than that, uh, ten times to two orders of magnitude than the current fountain clock. So if, when you think about that, why is clock so important? First, you have to look at what, what's the error when you measure something using a light wave, like um, um, a, a laser um, distance measuring instrument. If you're off by a microsecond, you can be off close to about one, one kilometer. If you're off by a nanosecond, you can be off by a meter. Okay. Now, think about the satellites hovering around up there for the GPS system. Okay. Now it's almost like expected that it can take you to the, the, the door of the address you want to go to. Why are you able to do that? You can't do that before. And you can't do that now. It is the clock, the atomic clock. The atomic clock accuracy relates directly to the accuracy of the GPS systems because that, that clock is actually beam to each one of those satellites, and they, they, they basically synchronize these uh, GPS and satellites up there by the atomic clock. And so they have a very accurate reference. The error comes in is when the transmission from the GPS to your receiver, there are a lot of other things going on to, to cause the uncertainty to go higher, you know, like atmospheric uh, conditions and stuff like that can change the propagation constant of uh, uh, the radio wave. And so they, they have no way to adjust that real time. And so you have some errors involved with that. Otherwise, uh, you can get a very, very precise location because of the accuracy of the atomic clock. And when you turn on your cell phone, also you get a very accurate time. That's almost like synchronized to the atomic clock. You don't need a watch anymore. That's So now let's look at some uh, instrumentations that uh, we do. Uh, this has to do with our life science and chemical analysis as a segment of our business. And uh, let's look at chemical analysis. This is uh, liquid chromatograph and also gas chromatograph and actually also mass spectrometer, uh, spectrometer. All these things are used to measure uh, chemical content of things. For example, these instruments can be used to measure the material uh, uh, contamination of soil samples. Okay, and so you you feed the soil sample to this, these uh, instruments, and you can see what the content, chemical content, was there, you know, either petroleum or whatever, uh, uh, poison, pesticide, whatever. Um, this one measures uh, an air sample. What's in the air? There's something there, uh, contam contaminants in the air that is not desirable. Uh, this one measures um, I forgot what this one measures. Uh, oh, I see. Um, th these are actually pesticides uh, and um, uh, in some liquid samples or food samples. And so you can see how these instrumentations can be used uh, to detect uh, contaminations, uh, um, pesticides and whatever in the environment, in your food supply, and the many, many things. Uh, and also including drug, drug abuse cases, where actually you can detect like uh, Olympic athletes, they can send their uh, urine sample, go through one of these machines, they can tell if they've been taking certain kind of illegal drugs or not.
Yeah, this is another kind of a measurement things from and uh, break it down to basically the atomic level to see what kind of uh, atoms uh, or molecules uh, con uh, contain in the liquid or solid samples. And then this has to do with life science. And you look at the DNA, RNA, or cell structures and identify what they are uh, uh, quickly. And so that's part of the, uh, the human uh, genome uh, project. Uh, this has been applied and used in that area in terms of the, uh, uh, the genome research. This is a, 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 a um, basically a group of products sort of sit in between the life science chemical analysis stuff uh, to the macro world of like uh, microwave instrumentation. Now this is the atomic force microscope so you can s scan things and look at things, the very, very tiny things. Uh, a couple of them are very new products. For instance, you can use these instruments to measure something actually is in action. Uh, this is measuring uh, a fuel cell membrane and look at what it will do at different levels of humidity, real time. So this is looking at the membrane at 25% humidity and this is looking at it at 65% humidity. Uh, this is, no, this is, these are atomic force microscopes, uh, scanning microscopes. Uh, electron microscopes rely on electron beams, okay, and the scatter beam, sort of like an X-ray scattering uh, type of uh, technology. This one actually uses a very, very fine tip, and that it, it hovers just above the surface that you want to measure. So when you scan the surface, it picks up the, the little, um, um, basically, atomic force, the differences, and be able to actually, in, uh, in, in, in modulations of the, the, the tip, and then a laser beam actually shines on the top surface where the little uh, uh, port is connected to. So it can, it can sense a modulation using light wave and then can pick up exactly what the surface looks like. Okay. And so you can pick up, because it's non-contact, you can actually use things, look at things when it's going on. And, and, and a lot of times the electron microscope is a very different environment. You cannot look at the thing actually when 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 chemical reactions is happening. Okay, this you can see that. For instance, you look at wax, and uh, when you heat wax up to a certain temperature, you can look at the molecular structure change. Okay, right there. You know, underneath when you're scanning it, you can see that actually happening. And you can see the, m the molecular structure change from here to this when you get the uh, higher than 120 degrees C, and it stays there when you cool it down. And this is a stainless steel actually used in, um, in the um, a paste, a paste uh, the battery co compartment. And uh, the, there was uh, some imperfections in, in the uh, uh, in the cleaning process uh, of the surface and uh, whatever they apply to it. And so it's not corroding, it causes problem. And so they want to see what's going on here and they can actually see this happening after they put this um, in, a, in, in a corrosive environment and actually see the corrosion developing. Now, this is something that uh, you got to be careful about. This is the, the magnetic force <coughs> uh, uh, picture of, um, this is a, a zip disk, okay, magnetic disk. Uh, this is a, uh, a Sony high MP tape, all right? So both of these have been erased, quote unquote, okay? Both of these have been erased, go through the normal erasing process. But under the magnetic force microscope, you can actually see the ones and zero bits of this material still. Okay, 
each one of these lines represent a one or zero. All right? So now if you somehow accidentally erase your hard drive and you take it to someone who may have a machine like this, he can recreate the ones and zeros of the erased hard drive. Now why do I say it's important that you destroy things you want to keep in the secret? <laughs> you don't want anyone to read your confidential information, whether it's a, a, you know, a disk drive um, uh, or some sort of magnetic medium. Destroy it. Otherwise, someone may have a machine like this to recover this information and get confidential information. And that's where technology is today. Allow, yeah, you can measure things like this. Uh, it will be very difficult to do at the atomic level. This is at the atomic level, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. The only thing you can do is to melt it, <laughs> destroy it in some way, so you don't no longer have a complete information. Yeah, this is just. This Yeah, except at different depths, right? So the most recent one probably is the one that will show up the most. But if you look at the under an ordinary microscope, that's what you see. Oh, I don't see any information on it, on the tape. But under the magnetic force microscope, you can actually see this. No, the, the, the line actually represents a, uh, the, the, the bit information, ones and zeros. Right. That was recorded on it, right. The, the thing is that probably may not correlate to that. Yeah, yet it may have to do with the surface finish of this. Yes? I would say you still probably have some trace at, at the atomic level. Yeah, at the atomic level. Now don't forget, we are looking at these now at practically the atomic level. And then the laser thing we, we just uh, uh, introduced is this uh, scanning microwave microscope. It's combining atomic force microscope with a networking analyzer. Then two combined allow you to see things that we weren't able to see before. And that was... Uh, voted as uh, one of the top 100 R&D magazine products for 2009. And what this thing allows us to do is to measure not just the topography, but also look a little bit deeper and looking at uh, basically like the capacitance effect. And we, are, we, be, we were able to zoom in to, to this little square area here this is magnified to this, okay? Uh, and look at some defects in this structure when we were never able to see before. And this defect has to do with so oxidation of um, a passivation layer that wasn't uh, cleaned off completely and, 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 and caused problems with this memory device. So. This is, you give the third dimension perspective on things with a microwave um, reflection measurements in addition to the atomic force. Another application for this instrument is actually, actually looking at biological effects like uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. So these are the fibers that cause Alzheimer's disease. And we can see the 3D structure of this fiber. And we can actually see if any drug interactions can occur, you know, how it may interact with certain drugs and medications by being able to scan this and look at it in real action. So we expect some real good thing come out with this research uh, in the future for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And but we can also see now DNAs, and this is DNA strand in the air. And imagine, you know, if you can see that, you can see drug interactions um, or 
HIV virus and uh, how it attacks you know, all these other medical related uh, phenomena. This is an interesting one. This is what we call actually a, um, a nano uh, a strength gauge in a way. It pulls apart a very, very tiny thing. In this experiment, actually, it was um, one of the National Geographic uh, specials. It showed the, uh, how this machine can pull apart uh, a strand of spider silk and look at the, the strength, the tensile strength. And you can also, of course, use that to pull apart a uh, nanotube and see what kind of strength it has. Other devices, similar with fibers. Another brand new product we just introduced last year is what we call a nonlinear network analyzer. Normally, networks, we think of networks as linear networks. This thing can measure the nonlinear behavior of uh, uh, an amplifier, for instance. Why is this important? Uh, because a lot of amplifiers, especially today, uh, they operate in the nonlinear mode. You know, most of them are driven hard in the nonlinear region. And the reason they want to do that is to actually make them more efficient. Uh, if you can characterize the nonlinear behaviors and be able to Basically, what we call the fold the energy wasted in the harmonic uh, uh, frequencies, fold them back in, your amplifier will be a lot more efficient. So if you can find the correct termination, uh, the, 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 the correct uh, uh, imp uh, matching conditions, uh, you can make your amplifier very efficient. And that's part of the reason why your cell phones today now is reasonably cool. But that's not the big saving. The big saving is really in the transmitters. All the cell tiles out there that transmit signals. Yeah, as a matter of fact, for every watt of energy the cell tile transmits, you have to use about seven watts of energy to drive it and cool the system. Okay, the cooling actually use up more energy than the actually uh, being used to transmit the signal. So you can see why it's important to try to make amplifiers more efficient. Then you don't waste all that energy to cool them. Okay. So there's a lot of work going on internationally in trying to make amplifiers more efficient. Of course, they make your battery last a lot longer too. Oops. So these are just some of the applications uh, for uh, the nonlinear network analyzer. So to deal with semiconductor process design, and, this, and also the main thing is the power amplifier design. And uh, there's a lot of research going on in university to optimize device uh, characteristics uh, also for efficiency. This is another new product, and actually we bought a sample here. Uh, this is what I call, we call the uh, handheld um, analyzer. Uh, its main purpose originally was to allow people who have to maintain the cell tiles or similar kind of uh, transmitters, you know, these things are uh, a few hundred feet up off the air, uh, the, the ground. So some people have to go up there to troubleshoot and um, maintain these um, antennas and stuff up there. Uh, they need something portable. Yeah, they think I'll bring a 100-pound uh, network analyzer up there, uh, up and down the, the, the tower. So they need something portable. So what we did here is we squeeze a bench top equipment that's maybe that weighs 50, 60 pounds at least into a six-pound battery-operated uh, device. So this thing actually covered the frequency range of 2 megahertz to 6 gig. It has a one point network analyzer built in, a spectrum, a spectrum analyzer here. And you can also connect up a USB power meter and use that to measure power as well and uh, on the go. And so it can do quite a few things. Um, 
it can actually it's already calibrated at the port here so that you don't even need to perform a network analyzer calibration. And uh, you can go ahead and just stop measuring things. Uh, when this thing is booting up, show a couple of slides here. So it, it can measure a bunch of things, network analyzer uh, functions, spectrum analyzer functions, the power meter functions, uh, some six pounds. Um, it has no fans. It need, doesn't need an air cooling. It, it is, the whole thing is contained. So that it, it's actually um, a, what we call splash resistant. So we actually put this thing uh, out on the lawn on the sprinkler system and wet it and it still operates. And we have uh, battery power, can operate about four hours with this thing. Again, efficiency is the th important thing, right? So we have a lot of power hungry things in there, used to be. And now we can squeeze things and make things more efficient so that we can use a battery to operate these things. Yay. Pardon me? No, we don't want to have hard drive in there. Uh, we have a SE card in there. Uh, the hard drive is a problem when you transport things around and throw them in the back of your truck. You know, these people are very, very rough with these instruments. <laughs> the people climb up and down these uh, towers, and I have no time to, to be that careful about things. And the hard drive just won't survive that kind of environment. There's no way. Uh, we do have a SD card and also um, a RAM memories to take care of most of the things. You, you, it does have a USB uh, um, so on the side here there are various interconnects the two S USB interconnect that you can put a USB uh, memory uh, device there uh, is a LAN can allow you to hook up to a LAN and control this thing with a computer uh, and the, another mini uh, micro uh, SD card that you can uh, pull in and out So, what I'm going to do with this thing? Um, so I'm going to look at a spectrum analyzer mode, and I want to see what the heck is in here. Well, actually, uh, there are a few things to get into here. I'm not sure what they are. This thing actually has demodulation capability. If I zoom into the signal, and actually, if it's a radio station, I can pick it up. And if it's like uh, a KZST, I can actually play the music they're playing. OK. Uh, so one of the demo, one of the favorite demos that we, 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 we did in the, in the trade shows is we actually have a stereo uh, headphone hook up to this thing and tune into a local station and let people come in and listen to the music. So it's, uh, and the reason you want to do that is you want to be able to demodulate signal and see where the interference may be coming from. You want to detect the interference signal. But one of the major problems for um, cell phone operator is you got to, they have a lot of antennas right next to each other. They can interfere with you so if it's not set up properly. And when they interfere, they drop calls and cause all kinds of problems. And so it's important for them to be able to detect what is being interfered with. As a matter of fact, actually, they said one of the biggest problems they have if they interfere with cell phones is actually the cable TV people. The cable network people, they, they're less careful about what they do in, in terms of their antennas, how they feed signals from one side to another side. And a lot of times they point in their antenna right at one of these cell towers and cause all kinds of problems. But with this, they can tell exactly where things are. With a directional antenna, they can see where things are going. And so in here, actually, I pick up, looks like they're in, in the cell bands. And there's some cell phone being on and off going on there. Some transmission. Uh, let's see if I can make a mark there. Six hundred sixty megahertz, one of them. This one is coming on and off. Yeah, that's definitely, this one is a, a 
cell phone band and say, hey, hey, come get 50 farm egg. So uh, that depends on options you uh, you want to go from about 7K to 15 or a little bit more. And so it depends on which ones you turn on in terms of functionality. Uh, the standard modulation stuff, digital modulation, you cannot pick them up, right? Yeah, dig uh, this digital, uh, you, you don't demodulate it in terms of sound or video kind of thing. But you can see um, the, the digital modulation signals, okay? And you can uh, zoom into that thing, and you can see whether it's CDMA or uh, GM. Think so. Yeah, we can do DMAT to some extent, yeah, all kind of DMAT, right. It um, depends on uh, what what the setup is in the instrument. So we have all kind of demodulation capabilities built in. Uh, for commercial? Of course, the military want to use it, that's fine. Yeah, I'm happy to sell them a few hundred of these. <laughs> a school want to use it, fine, yeah. It's, it's now it's at a price range. Actually, um, you can you can use them in classrooms to demonstrate certain principles. You know, like spectrum analysis, what does that do, right? Well, in network anal and analysis, you know, how how does it work? How do you calibrate a system? Oh, we just introduced a two-port network analyzer uh, of the same physical size and the same physical thing that cover from uh, also the same frequency range. So it would be a full two-port nickel analyzer uh, of the same size, and calibration and everything is just like a benchtop version. Actually, it has some built-in function here that you don't even need to calibrate. It's all self-calibrated. So you want to make, make nickel analyzer measurements, something like that, in the classroom would be easy to do and demonstrate. You don't have to require two people to hold a benchtop thing. Uh, Two meg to six gig right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the two megahertz. Is so we can do uh, insertion loss. It actually has a, a rudimentary time domain capability in there too. To like in this case, what we call distance to fault. Measurements, so you can look at the end of the cable, see where it may be damaged somewhere along the line, some distance away. So you can identify the fault location of the cable. And so it's it's not a full not a full time domain, but it is useful for this purpose. DSL, um, yeah, you can you can use that. Um, actually, some companies actually you have a little adapter that goes onto a phone line. Then you can measure uh, the, uh, a phone line uh, distance of fault. Uh, one of the applications actually, uh, I was asked if can you look at things that's been split out hundred different ways. No, you cannot do that because distance fault has a limitation. When you go in there and split, maybe if you split out in uh, two ways, you still be able to see something. But you, you split it out in both six or seven different ways, like a typical house, and sometimes you want to do that, and then you won't be able to see all that stuff. That means you still have to go to the node to, to, to look at it, right? Uh, so there, there are ways you can sort of tell um, you know, where the problem is, and looking at even if it's split it a couple ways. You know. uh, but more than that, it's just too far down the, the line, and with too many things in between, you won't be able to. Yeah. And uh, we actually s tried that measurement uh, already, um, sort of like a DSL line kind of thing. Or even like a cable TV, it come into your house, and um, I actually took it home to measure the cable TV signals. Um, it's not pretty. <laughs> 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 That's what I call them, I say, 
the, the, the cable coming to my house doesn't have enough signal uh, where your digital content is. And then they came to cook their meter and look at that. Yeah, I don't have enough. So they have to pull out the old cables, replace all the power splitters and stuff with newer ones in order to get the high definition program. Because the old stuff rolls off around 600 megahertz. The new stuff, all the, the high definition and the new digital programming, it goes beyond one gig. And so your cable and your power splitters and the amps cannot handle that. You're not going to get any digital high definition TV content. Right, with the fiber, you, you need what we call a, um, uh, a converter. So basically it's um, uh, from a fiber to a microwave converter. And uh, we, we have some of those accessories, as a matter of fact. Uh, some other companies sell them as well, and where you can convert a uh, fiber optic signal, down convert it to microwave signal, and be able to measure with you. So these are just a yeah, special may I also have a power meter. This is just a showing the screenshot of the power meter application. So the potential applications for something like this actually has all uh, been suggested uh, by our customers. Uh, like uh, breast cancer detection. Um, this is an easy thing in portables. You can set up a few of these and be able to actually use it as an imaging device to detect breast cancer. Uh, there's still a lot of research going on in that area. Um, there were some encouraging results, uh, but you know, FDA always takes a long time to approve any of these things. And, um, so it's still uh, going on. Um, the heart condition monitor, you can uh, actually, I couldn't get the picture of a patient actually laying in bed, and then strap a couple of detectors in on his chest, and then have a negro analyzer next to it. And what, what that thing does is actually measure the moisture content in his uh, lung cavity that seem to relate to the heart conditions that he has. And so that's a, a sort of like a new measurement technique to monitor heart condition. And what they want to do is make it portable. You, know, if you cannot make a big echo analyzer and carry it around with you when you walk around. But something like this, maybe half the size, may be feasible that you can strap it on your waist and be able to carry around and monitor real time what your heart condition is, and especially in hospitals. And also you can use that uh, to detect uh, frozen food spoilage because the frozen food is already prepackaged. The moisture content or whatever is in there, you can monitor using microwave energy. And so a lot of times you can use that to see if some other things are in that. Uh, inside the package, not, not just you know, moisture. And you can actually detect that. Or the, the grain content monitor, uh, grain moisture content. And that's a big thing for uh, agriculture people because <coughs> the grain, if it's too dry, the, the producer loses money. Uh, yeah, it's light, light. It's too much liquid in there, the government say, oh, we are cheating. Right. So they have to monitor this just right so that they can make maximum profit what is allowed <laughs> in a grain. Yes? These uh, can be pretty small level. Um, uh, you are talking about um, close, you know, microwatt kind of numbers. You don't need a lot of energy for these um, monitoring. Um, you're looking at microwatts of energy, yeah, or less depends on how it's set up. Um, a wine and beer alcohol level monitor, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we have measure wine and beer, and, and we can tell the difference between you know, different beers and different uh, wines uh, for the alcohol content. That was one of our favorite demos, too, in the trade shows. You know, people come by and say, hey, what are you doing with these wine bottles? And <laughs> uh, 
and also the fear models here. And we dip the sensor in there and monitor these things and say, oh, yeah, this is core, this is, you know, <laughs> something else. There are a lot of, uh, many, many applications. When you have a portable instrument, that is actually bring out a lot of crazy ideas, neat ideas. You have some good ideas? Tell us. Yeah. How to use a portable instrument to, to uh, do better things. So what's next? Nanotechnology. Well, we need international reference standards. It's a very new technology. But in terms of measurement, we can see things, but we don't know exactly what it is in terms of certain properties. Okay? And so we need reference standards so that everybody agree what they're seeing is what everybody agree what's seeing. Right? And, and in terms of binicular like, analysis impedance, we, there's no nano impedance standards right now. Actually, a lot of things are already going beyond nano and gig. As we look at things, there are things being done in the Zafico and the terahertz range. And why is that? Because now you're looking at subatomic particles and also up to the terahertz measurements. And in, in terms of uh, imaging and stuff like that, and there's some real, um, a lot of effort going on there for you know, homeland security and stuff like that in the terahertz range. Of course, having all these instrumentations, they help us see things better. We should be able to, to, be, to get things more efficient, uh, environmental friendly designs you know, from cell phones and airplanes. Right? The cell phones still got, you can do more improvements to reduce the power consumption. You know, instead of lasting one day, it may last a few days on one charge. And we also should be able to have better understanding of drug and virus, bacteria, and normal cell interactions uh, from a lot of these instrumentations and things that we can measure them. And that's can improve right now. Any questions? This one right now has uh, 60 dB. The new one has 100 dB. Okay. So you can already see this is the first generation. And this, the new generation is already better. So the 100 dB dynamic range. The spectrum analyzer actually is a little bit better because of the filtering capability. We haven't defined all the accessories yet in terms. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are still working on a list of things that way you can connect up to this. Right? So the, the, the most basic things right now, like antennas, uh, cables, and stuff like that, you can hook on to it. Uh, and they there talk about being able to hook up some additional attachments to the end of the cables and stuff like that to make specialized applications uh, measurements. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the firmware structure of this thing, I don't know what to call it, <laughs> it's multiple functions, um, such that you can add application to it quite easily. Uh, you can, if you follow the correct protocol, you can write your own application and control this thing to do measurements you want. Okay? And so in terms of uh, uh, interconnects and stuff like that. Of course, the, the, the LAN is always one possibility. Um, the, the USB uh, can also can be used to attach to other things. You know, no one says you cannot attach like a USB uh, GPS to it. Uh, although uh, that, that is a, a subject of uh, discontent for, for me is 
the GPS uh, manufacturers, they don't seem to follow the same rule. Not all of them follow the same uh, protocols and stuff. So one vendor may work, another vendor may not work. Uh, and that's some of these USB interconnect. As a matter of fact, USB is one of those most loosely defined things. Yeah. And, um, you, you can find like even thumb drives, right? USB drives. You know, one manufacturer's USB drive will work fine uh, with your computer, but uh, someone else's USB drive may not work at all. You can't even recognize it. And the same thing we face with instrumentation. Then you have USB ports. Uh, certain things will plug in, no problem. Other things may not. It's just the way the standard is right now. Bluetooth, all right, yeah. And so those are all possibilities. Mm -hmm. So those all have been discussed as uh, accessories and attachments. You can hook up to this thing. Yes. can determine in the millimeter range. You're talking about the atomic uh, force microscope kind of thing? Or you're talking about something else? Uh-huh. Yeah, the distance resolution, it turns out, uh, if you use a, you know, a time domain um, uh, reflectometer uh, methodology, uh, it's really a function of the, the bandwidth, right? So the higher frequency you can go, um, the, the, the better your resolution is in determining where things are located, right? And you can almost do the, the, the one over F kind of thing. So if it's F is six gig for this box, and one over that can sort of give you the time resolution and in translate into distance resolution of uh, how close you can do that. So for one millimeter, I don't think this one is capable of doing it. But with something that's a higher frequency uh, range, um, one millimeter, one over one millimeter is one over 10 to the minus, minus two. And I cannot calculate things in my head right now. I try to think in terms of uh, seconds and then into distance. Um, I had a trot there though <laughs> a little while back. Uh, so one millimeter, I think you probably need something up to 50 gig, 60 gig to resolve. Yes? That design is designed uh, in Santa Rosa is uh, built by a contract manufacturer. In this case, it's overseas. And to keep the cost low. Yes? <laughs> Woo. Uh, it might be, not this one, though. Uh, actually, I borrowed this from somebody else. <laughs> I do have one, an earlier prototype, but I don't want to bring it. Uh, it's pretty, pretty sad shape in the case and the stuff. I can play with it and get information out, but um, this is in high demand uh, in terms of demo units. Um, you can you can uh, request from our uh, local salespeople 
uh, to see if you know they can get you a loan or not. Um, but there are some floating around. As a matter of fact, you know we we rebate quite a few of these for people to demonstrate or as loaners to customers who wants to just uh, keep it a little bit longer to play with it. As a matter of fact, you, know, you may want to play with the latest one too, the two point negative analyzer. So for instance. Oh, the model number. Um, that's the N9912A. Uh, the new one is the 23A, I think. So, anything else? 